Um, I'd first like to thank you all for allowing me to present my presentation on the examination of the negative societal impacts of cloning. Um, I first became interested in the subject because I've always been interested in the field of genetics and how genes literally make us up, but over quarantine I actually watched a lot of sci-fi movies and that got me interested in cloning and how cloning is actually a real thing, it's not just something you see in the movies. Um, but a lot of people, including maybe some of you all, um, but hopefully now that you've read my research paper, you know that there are very many negative societal implications, um, namely on the ethics of cloning. So. The presentation will go as follows. I will begin with the history so that you guys understand how cloning began and how it progressed um, into what we see today. Um, we will then go into a scientific explanation so that you know the science of cloning, and then we can begin discussing the technical and ethical issues once you understand cloning. So this is Dolly the sheep. She is probably one of the most famous clones in history. Um, this is because of the science, scientific process that was used to clone her, um, but I will go into that more later in the presentation. This is Dolly and her surrogate mother here on the left, and that's Dolly full grown on the right, or I guess my right, but um, I would like to mention that Dolly only lived up to six years old, although um, sheep have a lifespan of 10 to 12 years, so clearly her lifespan was cut very, very short. So cloning actually began a very long time ago, in 1885, when Dreisch decided to use invertebrate animals, uh, or invertebrate organisms, and he split a two-celled embryo, uh, sea urchin embryo, and allowed the two cells to develop on their own into a fully functioning sea urchin organism. The same process was followed by Spayman when he used a two-celled embryo of a salamander, except salamanders are vertebrates, um, and he used a baby hair to split the two, which is very, very interesting to me. Um, and then the two cells developed on their own and formed a fully functioning organism. In 1952, Briggs and King performed the first successful nuclear transfer. Here is an enucleated egg cell in which the nucleus of the egg cell is removed, and then the nucleus of an embryonic cell is implanted into the egg cell, and then it grows and develops into a frog. So this was performed in a tadpole. Um, a similar process was performed in 1958. It's not on the timeline. However, um, Gurdon uh, extracted the nucleus of a somatic or adult cell and implanted it into an egg cell and then it formed a frog. However, the frog did have abnormalities in its adult life. Um, in 1984, a similar process to the 1952 experiment performed by Briggs and King was performed by Willidson, in which he extracted the nucleus of an embryonic cell and implanted it into an egg cell, and then it formed the first mammal clone, which was a sheep. So I mentioned embryonic cells and somatic or adult cells, but what even are embryonic or somatic cells? So to your left or my right, you see an embryonic cell, and they are undifferentiated cells. So they have the ability to form any cell, to become any cell in the body, and then somatic or adult cells um, are differentiated cells, so they are already established a role and um, a function in the body, and that can be seen as skin cells or intestinal cells, etc. This is why Dolly significant. This is why Dolly is so significant because she was the first mammal to be cloned from an adult cell, which is clearly harder to be done than an embryonic cell since they are already differentiated. So I know this picture looks quite complicated, but I'll just walk you guys through the most important steps. Here you see how they clone Dolly. This is um, organism cloning, which is one of the two um, topics, or one of the two kinds of cloning that fall under the umbrella of genetic cloning. So there is a donor, a nucleus donor, in which the somatic cell, the nucleus of the somatic cell, is either removed through a syringe-like device and then implanted into the egg cell, or the entire cell could be fused with electricity into the egg cell, and then it can be implanted into the surrogate mother, who will give birth to the live, or in this case live, because it is a mammal, um, cloned organism. Another type of cloning is gene cloning, used in antibiotics, vaccines, or gene therapy. Uh, gene cloning isolates a gene using one of the two types of restriction enzymes, 
that gene is combined with the plasmid donor since isolated genes cannot clone themselves um, or duplicate themselves. And once those two um, are binded, it forms a recombinant cell in which it can multiply by itself and then the gene is multiplied and duplicated. This is Jennifer Dudna. Um, CRISPR has been around uh, for a very long time, since 1987, but in 2012, groundbreaking research discovery was, uh, was established or was made by uh, Jennifer Dubna and a colleague in which they found that CRISPR can actually cut and repair genes. But what is CRISPR? CRISPR, or clustered, clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats, um, has the ability to cut and repair abnormal genes. Um, CRISPR seems like it could be a very good tool and technology, um, and it actually does aid in cloning and incentivizes cloning since it can cut and repair genes faster. Um, however, Dudna herself, who was one of the founding researchers of CRISPR, has commented on the risks that CRISPR imposes. Um, CRISPR, since it has the ability to cut and repair abnormal genes, raises the concerns of what is an abnormal gene and why does it need to be cut and replaced in the first place. CRISPR's goal is to create an optimal society, but who determines what is an optimal society? Another uh, factor that interferes with genetic cloning is eugenics or epigenetics. Um, epigenetics is the study of how the environment changes uh, gene expression. So one of the most uh, useful ex or examples that I like to use is in identical twins. Although identical twins have the exact same genetic makeup, they will probably act differently and they will probably look a little bit different. Um, and this is because of ep epigenetic factors. So the environment that they're in, their interactions, and just how they live are probably going to be different. Um, so epigenetics poses a uh, negative impact on gene cloning because uh, the cloned organism will not be the same as the original organism because of the new environment that it's probably going to be in and the different interactions that it will experience. So those were some of the technical issues with cloning and now we can discuss the uh, ethical issues with cloning. So <laughs> here you can see Scientists obviously want to continue expanding on their discovery. They want to research more about cloning, how we can use it, and unfortunately there isn't, well, I won't, don't want to say unfortunately, but there isn't much federal funding um, that accompanies uh, genetic cloning because, as you can see in this graph, the top shows those who vote that uh, cloning is morally wrong and those who vote that it is morally correct. And you can see here in 2018, the number of people who voted that uh, genetic cloning is morally correct did have, it did experience a spike, but it's still not as much as those who would say that it is morally unacceptable. So cloning um, has a slippery slope of arguments. Um, CRISPR raises the uh, questions of what is a perfect society, what is abnormal, what is acceptable, but also the, this idea of perfection has been seen in scientists, doctors, and even parents. Parents are now starting to use CRISPR and IVF technology to try to specially design their babies. This is called designer babies, um, and it also has to do with eugenics. Um, so, uh, specially designing your baby and specially designing humans is such a talked about topic that even George W. Bush has commented on this topic. In his congressional address, he pleaded with Congress to implement a ban on human cloning. But trusting his argument with the fact of uh, Christianity and how our country was founded on Christian beliefs. Christianity argues that cloning would interfere with their idea of God's plan and uh, how human life is a gift from God that should not be interfered with. And Islamic views would also agree with Christian views um, saying that the negative consequences would outweigh the potential benefits. But Judaism, on the other hand, would actually argue for cloning, saying that their uh, idea of divine creation, cloning does not actually interfere with their idea of divine creation. Since cloning um, makes organisms out of pre-existing cells, um, divine creation argues that creating something out of nothing is wrong. But since cloning creates something out of something, it is not wrong. 
So we have the technology in our hands, but to what extent should we use it to? Thank you. <laughs> Um, I would also like to mention that this quote is taken from the University of Houston Law Department, but I did not cite that. Questions? Jennifer Dawidna, not Dawidna. And there were two other people mm -hmm. who got the Nobel Prize along with her at the same time for the same you know, this way. So, we have all three of them. If you're talking about a person who is more prominent in this field. Mm -hmm. She um, commented on the risks of CRISPR, which is why I decided to mention her name specifically. What about the um, uh, use of cloning to produce organs? highly beneficial um, for multiple millions of, of people who are in need of, of, of uh, organ transplant. Yeah, so um, I actually researched this, but I decided not to include it because it would also create even more of a slippery slope of arguments. Um, but a whopping 19 people die per day because they just don't get their organ transplant fast enough. Um, and so, yes, it would be really, really beneficial, um, and you could probably save a lot of lives, but I just think that that, would, that could interfere with cloning humans in a sense because you would be cloning human organs. And so I don't know if it's really going to be used, but it hasn't yet. The Not other that question I, I have is if we could edit out things that we know um, um, in the process of gestation that um, are um, part of the DNA that um, are really problematic produce any number of conditions that, that are serious um, in nature. Um, I know that the bigger issue is we don't want designer babies, but I think that there are, you know, I think most people when they're looking at this are thinking about the myriad of, of conditions that could be either with stem cells or with cloning um, obviated with this technology. And so what would you, what, what is the, why would that be bad? Well, <laughs> I feel like that's also that has just to it has to do with your opinions. I think like that's the um, that's an issue that I encountered with researching this is that everything has to do with opinions and how people view things. And so while there are benefits to everything, there are also downsides. And so it's just a matter of do the downsides outweigh the benefits. Well, I think the issue. Um Daniel, in history, eugenics has been problematic, and when it goes back to the 1930s and the Nazis and, 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 and that sort of thing, and other people who have experimented with eugenics, eugenics we know can be problematic um, on a variety of levels. It's trying to you know, control populations mm -hmm. and create populations in a certain way and eliminate people um, um, who you think should be in the population. But the idea of taking us this technology advancement of this technology to produce organs, to produce uh, or to modify um, um, at a stage in the um, gestation of removing a part of the DNA that we know is going to lead to a um, serious condition, Down syndrome, for example. Why not do all you know, hemophilia, anything? Why not take that, if we can do that, why not let CRISPR take that out? Can they remove the extra chromosome in a gestation with Down syndrome? There is a sickle cell uh, process now where they can remove the DNA responsible for sickle cell disease in babies. Mm -hmm. it's, it's possible, but I don't know if it's like legally allowed. I mean, we're still in the are still the You're interested. asking about chromosomal disorders. You're talking about genetic disorders, and those are very different things. With the genetic editing and cloning, you can for certain diseases. But I don't think the science is there yet for doing for whole chromosomes. So certain disease, Down syndrome is a chromosomal disorder. Turner syndrome, when a female only has one X chromosome instead of two. Those, I, I don't think the science is there yet. It doesn't mean that we, it shouldn't be debated and discussed, but I think the science isn't there yet saying, yes, we can do that. 
but it is for, for the genetic stuff. So significant amount of the funding is going towards that for the last couple of years? I think to answer your question of why not do that, in my opinion, um, which is, of course, this is all opinionated now, um, for actual diseases, it could be benefic beneficial, but for just disorders, for example, like Down syndrome, I feel like that just, it just interferes with your sense of identity and how, like, what is abnormal? Like, certain people will view something as abnormal, like genetic disorders. You want somebody, somebody may view um, uh, Down syndrome as abnormal, but other people will, like, for example, the parents of that child, why would you want to change your child? So, but then that also goes into designing your baby. Some people will say, yes, let me design my baby. Let me pick their eye color. Let me pick their hair. But other people will say, no, I just want to have my child naturally the way they are and I'll love them either way. So. And I think whenever you manipulate nature um, and you try to manipulate diversity, there are consequences, obviously. Um, and this is a whole new field. The worry, I mean, the concern I have is that the, is the argument that you're making is that cloning is too risky um, to really continue. Because I, Who's going who's to prevent this from happening? I guess there's a convention, theoretically, on, on CRISPR, for example. Some scientists in China decided that he was going to ignore that and, and did something. Um, I, I'm sure that there's going to be other people who are going to do the same thing. How are we, the, the, the genie's out of the bottle. How are we going to really control this? Mm -hmm. That's exactly the, the question that I would like to leave you all with is, now that you know the negative impacts and you know the potential benefits, we have the technology, but how should we proceed with it? So that's definitely the point. So we often speak about the medical human aspects of cloning. Can you speak up a little bit about the agricultural uses? Yeah, so that's actually something that I was uh, very interested in. Um, when I was younger, I watched a documentary um, about our meat industry, and that made me go vegan. I did not want to eat that anymore. Um, we, we also watched a recent documentary on how lettuce can carry like E. coli bacteria and all that, so now I just don't want to eat lettuce anymore. But GMO products and um, like gen they're, they're literally clones, like sometimes the things that we ingest and put in our bodies are clones of plants. Um, and so that's something that I didn't research too much on because I was focused more on like the negative um, impacts of like, eth like ethically. Um, but there are like benefits and negatives, uh, or negative impacts, I guess, um, of GMO product foods, of plants and agriculture, and <clears throat> gene uh, cloning, the second type of cloning that I mentioned, is very much used in the agricultural aspect. Yes, if, not, excuse me, uh, if you let you know, some plant just grow on its own for thousands of years, is that not gene modification? Naturally. I guess so, but I think the argument here is humans getting into that and manipulating us, manipulating nature, like with our self, like ourselves. We do it daily. We do it with, with, with drugs, we do it with food, we do it with the environment. Um, we were in an air conditioned building. Who's Nathan? Can I see who's Nathan Stephens? Um, um, yeah, he is my mom's client's nephew, um, and he has a doctor degree. He's Dr. Nathan Stephens, um, and he's a professor at the University of Wisconsin, I believe, um, a genetics professor. And so he did his fair share in like gene, like learning about genes and working in a lab. But now he's a professor at the and at the university. And he had um, sustained conversations about mm -hmm. this topic. Yeah. Through Zoom, unfortunately. You said uh, you watched a lot of sci-fi movies, and uh, could you like, tell us some examples so we can watch them? <laughs> um, yeah. So there's a new one that I haven't watched yet, but it's called They Cloned Ty They Cloned Tyrone, and it's on Netflix. And I want to watch that, but I haven't yet. And then there's another that one. Like a comedy. Yeah, it is. It is. But it, like, it. I'm pretty sh like. Based off of the trailer, I haven't watched it yet, but based off of the trailer, it shows like some real issues about like cloning and how like, 
I mean, obviously, like when you see it in sci-fi, the clones turn into like robots that want to kill the original or something like that. So have you seen Jessica? I have not actually, but there's also the a documentary that Miss Buckley and I talked about a little bit. I forgot the name of it, but it's pretty new as well. What was it? I think it's King of Clones. King of Clones, I think. But it's um, I think it was based in China though, so it's not really what's going on here, but more in other countries. I so there was. 1984, which is kind of depressing, but then there is Brave New World, which I didn't finish, to be honest. But there was this idea of second class citizenship for genetically engineered people who maybe are not as smart. Uh, what do you think about that? So they would like change the genetics of people who are not as smart? They just had like this working class uh, who wasn't endowed with, with much brain, uh, and uh, they were perfectly happy. Doing many other labor, labor, and uh, you know, not having ambitions to maybe like take over the elite class. But don't we need the working class? We need people to do those jobs. Okay, it's okay. Like. If you have not read the book, I can't ask <laughs> yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, give your opinions about it. I feel like everyone has their strengths and weaknesses, so maybe there's a strength to be found in those people as well. Are there any international bodies that try to offer guidance on this? Because we know, like this. As I think Mr. Mitchell alluded to, national borders don't really do much. Like, if you have enough money and China has a different policy, you can go to China and do what you want. You go to Switzerland, you go mm -hmm. to Mexico. It doesn't, it, but if you have the resources, what the United States decides to do doesn't really have a lot yeah. of impact. So, so, is there any groups out there that are trying to get everybody to, to play by the same rules? I'm not quite sure. I need to research more of like groups that will try to get everybody on the same page, but I do know that different countries are very different. Like the Dolly was actually cloned in Europe first. So like a lot of the clones have not really been here in the United States. It's been more in Europe or China. So yeah. Actually, I think there's there's a, I believe there is a, um, uh, already in place, a convention of sorts um, um, between countries on CRISPR, um, which is why the Chinese scientists that engaged in his experiment was censured by his own, believe it or not, by the, um, uh, the PRC, which kind of surprised everyone, said because it did violate what is, I don't know if it's a, you know, it's not like a UN convention, it is some kind of understanding about CRISPR, the use of CRISPR, so I don't know that, and I, I, I talked to you about that, I, I, I don't have the name of it, but I know that that has been a conversation about what is the ethical use of this technology, which is just in its infancy. Mm -hmm. And so it's not gonna go away. Um, and you know, do we can we have some you know ground rules on this? Um, and um, I think they did come with them there was a general understanding. Now whether it's you know in writing, I that, that, I, that I, I can't say, but I, 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 I'm aware of it only because of the fact that the Chinese government, in response to the fact that you violated this understanding about CRISPR, um, quickly had to censure this, this scientist uh, for this, what he did. Yeah, there's a lot of interesting things that I will be research, continuing my research on. It doesn't end here. <laughs>